Thank you very much for being here. We appreciate uh, to have uh, this uh, wonderful audience and uh, very diverse. My name is Josefina Enfedake. I am a policy officer at the DG Research and Innovation of the European Commission for Biodiversity. And other uh, colleagues from, from my DG and from other DGs in the Commission are also here uh, to talk for the first, this is going to be the first uh, workshop uh, on the future possible European partnership on biodiversity. I'm glad that you are here and I expect we have a very, very fruitful discussions. Well, I was promised that there would be a slide on Slido. We have, um, we will have discussions uh, in um, in breakout groups, in a normal uh, participatory style. But we will also have open this uh, hashtag biodiversity in the Slido. So go to the application Slido or download it, because during today and tomorrow you will be able to upload your comments. We haven't um, uh, put any, any direct questions. So comments, suggestions can go to the Slido and they will be processed. And by the end, I guess that tomorrow we are going to show also some of the, of the comments. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so welcome on behalf of Bailvesa. Uh, we are very pleased to have this uh, meeting organized with the European Commission. And uh, we do hope that it will be a fruitful uh, meeting leading to a uh, partnership on biodiversity. I have one uh, slide, probably I have two. Yeah. Uh, to present you very briefly as uh, the objectives of the, the workshop. The, the first thing is to make sure that we will inform you uh, because uh, I guess that uh, there is kind of uh, heterogeneity in terms of level of information about European partnership. So uh, to reach common ground uh, of understanding about this kind of tool, new tool, uh, proposed by the European Commission, part of uh, the future framework program. Uh, and then we will update you on uh, where we are in terms of uh, the current status of discussions uh, about a possible European partnership on biodiversity. And then you will have presentations, so presentations uh, by people from the European Commission services, in particular uh, DG Research and uh, DG Environment, presenting how they see um, what could uh, be a European partnership, the needs, the expectations they have regarding to this tool. And I need my slides, if it's possible to uh, remove me. It's not very interesting to see me. Uh, okay. Uh, then uh, you have uh, uh, presentation, uh, the vision, and the first basis proposed by Bailvasa in concertation with these uh, EC services regarding a possible partnership. And uh, there will be also a presentation by the EC uh, corresponding to the inputs um, and, and outcomes of a workshop organized in the context of the MICE initiative. So you will see this. And finally, all this, uh, it corresponds to the uh, first segment of the workshop, the plenary, and we will use this as a basis to then have a collective work on the four pillars of the European partnership through uh, thematic sessions. Uh, so you have seen there are three thematic sessions, one today, two tomorrow. And the objective is um, uh, in smaller groups to allow you to have your feedbacks. I don't have a slide for uh, representativity of uh, or the, the composition of, um, of the, the audience here. But uh, more or less, there, there is uh, more than one third of uh, ministries of uh, research environment agencies. They are uh, scientists, they are uh, private uh, actors, other stakeholders, uh, <coughs> and they are also research infrastructure, European research infrastructure uh, representatives, uh, and representative of uh, different uh, European initiatives. So a broad range of uh, people, stakeholders, uh, and we do need your insight, your view, uh, to help us to build in a connective manner this uh, European uh, partnership. So this is really what we expect here from you. So do not hesitate to have your say, to propose things, etc. In small groups, it's even uh, easier. And uh, it's really the objective, so do not be uh, shy. 
Having said that, uh, I start with the introduction of the subject. The European partnerships are new animals in the context of, um, of um, research and innovation funding. And they are in uh, Horizon Europe. They are going to start when the new framework program starts in the 2021. And this particular one has been proposed by, um, jointly by DG Research and DG Environment with the aim of building on the existing biodiversity partnership, bring together not only research actors, but also environment ministries, um, practitioners and third parties to try to link together research with policy and with society. But first, uh, we will have a presentation by my colleague Maria Reinfeldt that it's going to give us uh, an overview of what the European partnerships are going to be, knowing that this is new and still uh, there is a lot to be developed on the on concrete details, but this is, she's going to give us the framework. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me see if I could put... Um, if I could see my slides, please, on European partnerships. Uh, yes, well, uh, I will start uh, while uh, the slides go on. But uh, what is important is that uh, in Horizon Europe, uh, the partnership approach is uh, very much changed to compared to what we have in Horizon 2020. Uh, the reason for this was that uh, our stakeholders uh, research ministers, the LAMI group, uh, there was also in one voice that the landscape has gotten uh, too uh, crowded, there are too much uh, partnerships, there is no clear understanding of where the topics are coming, uh, so there was a clear call uh, to rationalize the partnership landscape. Also, uh, the need to improve the openness uh, of the partnerships and um, let me see, ah, voila, and, uh, and the need to also link the partnerships much better with the uh, EU uh, and Horizon uh, policy objectives. Uh, by these objectives, we uh, currently mean, the, for instance, the next commissioner's objectives, the Green Deal, but also Horizon objectives as uh, they are uh, defined in the legal base and also in the upcoming strategic plan, which we currently call orientations. Uh, this is how the landscape looks today. As you can see, there are different partnership approaches. Uh, the public-public, public-private, also kicks, uh, Fed flagships. And whilst in number we have uh, most of the public-public partnerships, then in terms of uh, uh, the budget, the public-private partnerships, uh, of course, take the, the bigger share. But uh, this uh, was found to be too heavy. And in uh, the... In under Horizon Europe, we have a much more simpler architecture and toolbox for partnerships. First of all, we call all uh, types of partnerships European partnerships. The reason for this is that there is no more uh, clear uh, differentiation between public-public and public-private. We see increasing uh, partnerships with uh, mixed players, so uh, we saw that this differentiation is artificial. There is also a common set of uh, criteria uh, uh, the whole, for the whole life cycle of partnerships, uh, which are much more ambitious. Uh, and in the heart of this uh, criteria framework is the notion that uh, we need to demonstrate, when we set up a partnership, we need to demonstrate that uh, they will be more effective in achieving the Horizon Europe objectives than uh, the traditional uh, calls for proposals would be uh, that are funded from the work programs. And uh, the other um, important criteria relate to increased openness, transparency, the partnership needs to be uh, coherent across the research and innovation funding landscape. Um, and the three forms uh, are, uh, are here, uh, the co-programmed, co-funded, institutionalized, I will go uh, more into detail uh, in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, here I will, uh, so, uh, the Commission has uh, put to public uh, 40 
uh, eight uh, partnership candidates uh, which are currently preparing and uh, this slide uh, tries to present a little bit uh, of, of how did we come to this. By strategic planning it has both internal and external elements. Uh, by internal we mean that already um, before we, we made the proposal to the public we had uh, intensive uh, co-design exercise uh, inside the commission to really try to see how do, can we come rationalize the 120 partnerships we have now into something more uh, strategic uh, and also fewer in number. Um, what is important is that the institutionalized partnerships, uh, mainly the Article 187, uh, 185 uh, of the treaty, uh, they are already defined in the regulation, so we don't have any leeway of, of proposing uh, additional ones. So. Uh, uh, this was uh, one of the boundary conditions for us. Mm. Uh, and, uh, and now uh, these candidates have been uh, to extensive consultation, notably with the member states. Uh, uh, with the member states, our entry point has been the Shadow uh, Programme Committee for Horizon Europe. Uh, and there we got a general endorsement of uh, the candidates we put forward. <laughs> but uh, additional uh, four ones uh, were presented or included uh, into the, the list of uh, candidates. The, I will only highlight the new ones, which is in cluster health is One Health AMR. Uh, then uh, in the climate, energy and mobility cluster, it's the sustainable smart cities and uh, zero emission waterborne transport. Uh, and in the digital cluster, uh, it falls between digital and food, it's the European Geological Service. So this is the main uh, novelty. But uh, this information is also available in the orientations document uh, that is online. Uh, relevant uh, for this discussion here, this uh, gives a little bit of an overview of, of the rationalization in, in uh, the food and agriculture. Uh, cluster uh, and, and the candidates uh, currently there. So uh, the overall number of 24 partnerships was, re was reduced to eight. Uh, also uh, the biodiversity is part of this. Uh, so what are the practical next steps? Um, so currently we have further consultations on, uh, ah, on the orientations uh, towards the strategic plan. Uh, but we see the partnership uh, candidates as more or less stable uh, because with the countries we have now had extensive consultations and there is uh, stability. And basically what this means is that we can go to the next steps of preparation, we can discuss with partners what is the vision, what are the commitments uh, that the partners want to bring into the table. Um, and then, uh, of course, all the co-funded and co-programmed partnerships need to be also identified in the strategic plan. This is a precondition for, for having a partnership. Um, and we see any elaboration of proposals as a co-creation with the Commission and, uh, uh, and the partners, especially since now there is uh, such a high tre threshold and also conditionality, so there needs to be uh, this moment of con convergence where also partners understand uh, what uh, needs to be understood in terms of coherence or openness. Uh, so, um, so close cooperation is, is uh, very important. Um, importantly, we're also uh, having impact assessment for the institutionalized partnerships. Uh, these are mostly uh, in cluster five, our, our majority of those, but what is in, important for this is that we are really also mapping all uh, the partnerships and interlinkages uh, in the impact assessment work. Um, and, and of course, without a political agreement on the MFF and the budget, uh, we cannot uh, have any um, say on, on what will be the contribution or to the partnerships on the Commission side uh, uh, and can only uh, discuss uh, the pa partners' contribution and, and only at later stage will, will this clarify. Um, so in terms of practical next steps, uh, what we have uh, done to ensure a good coordination uh, and, and guidance is that there is a, a guidance document, a template for uh, developing a, a proposal. And these are the different elements. And basically for the partnerships that start, uh, that want to start in 2021, 
uh, or 2022, the timeline is that we have asked uh, a first draft of this proposal in November, early December, so that we could also give feedback and some guidance. Uh, and then uh, by end of February, we see uh, this uh, as becoming more or less stable. Um, what is important, I know that uh, countries uh, have asked when uh, do you need to give your uh, contributions and uh, commitments. Uh, there, what is important is that for the, the co-pro, for, for the co-funded uh, partnerships, it is typically at the moment when the topic is uh, introduced in, uh, into the work program. So by that time, there should be a very clear idea already on the contributions. Um, and the confirmation of commitments will be at the time of the submission of, of the proposal. Um, the, yes, the, the work programs, uh, well, the drafting should start when the strategic plan has been uh, adopted uh, or approved, and then after that, the drafting of the work program can start, um, and around that time, uh, it should be uh, clear, yes. Uh, and on 2021, uh, the work programs can be adopted indeed. So about uh, implementation modes, I'm really uh, go getting towards the end, so uh, if you bear with me a little more. Uh, there are three types of implementation modes. And the, these implementation modes themselves do not have separate objectives. European partnerships have the same uh, ambition in terms of uh, what they need to achieve, uh, that they need to contribute to the policy objectives uh, and so on. But what is the main differentiating element, uh, elements is uh, basically the, the discussion should really start with the question of uh, who are the actors who are involved because uh, some are better suited to involving uh, member states and public partners, but others are uh, more suited to having industry at the core um, then uh, it's important to, to think what uh, are the types of activities that this partnership uh, wants to uh, carry out um, and, and what are the types of contributions from the side of, of the countries. Just to bring an example, uh, in the co-programmed model, uh, there the, it is based on a contractual arrangement and the idea is that uh, the union contribution is uh, implemented via work programs, normal comitology procedure, and in parallel, the partners' contributions are implemented by them, so it's parallel implementation. But for co-funded, which is based on a grant agreement, uh, there uh, the underlying notion is the, the pooling of programs, and it can have some side activities. Uh, I will also uh, show how it is in the legal Base, uh, ah, voila. But it can have uh, supporting activities uh, for networking, uh, for uh, training, uh, market deployment action. So as you can see, the definition of what is a program co-fund action in the legal base is, uh, is um, allowed to do more than uh, just re research and innovation. And in fact, uh, for all types of partnerships, uh, Although research innovation is at the core, the, the added value very often is that it makes linkages with policy uh, regulatory uptake. Um, in this, I would stop uh, and give it back to Josefina, unless there are any urgent questions. Yes, this one. Um, Going back to the concrete uh, case of um, the biodiversity partnership, we, uh, I only have one slide, I don't need to, to pass. Um, we uh, started discussions um, already uh, about a year ago, and we have arrived to the strategic part where we have to write, co-design co together this partnership and uh, we have had several preparatory meetings, uh, basically with Biodiversa Aeronet, but with other uh, parties like MAES, uh, Mapping and Assessment of um, Ecosystem Services. Um, and now this is the first workshop, strategic workshop, where we are going to advance in the preparation of this draft that by the end of this month is uh, going to be um, 
prepared and, and, and sent to us, to the Commission. Um, the, the objectives of this strategic workshop is this co-creation, where we are going to discuss uh, basically the, the contents of this first draft. We, we have seen Maria has shown the, the table of contents, so proposed objectives, possible activities, the outputs of the partnership, inclusiveness and stakeholder engagement and governance. And this will be um, explained in concrete terms by Xavier because Biodiversa has already started working, uh, but we want to make it inclusive and to, uh, and to include other uh, stakeholders and other partners because a co-funded partnership is about um, funding authorities that align the programs together to fund research in calls and this time it's going to be aligned with the European Commission as well so we can make an agenda, a common uh, strategic agenda together. But uh, other parties are welcome to the partnership, not necessarily funding, but also contributing with this strategic thinking, with the agenda setting and with the science policy uh, functions that we will discuss about that today and tomorrow. So by the end of November, uh, when we have a consolidated draft proposal, I think it's the moment that we send you back home to do your homework and to try to involve uh, the other counterparts in your member states, in your countries, for example. And I know that today there is a majority of research agencies, but we still are, are we still lacking a lot of uh, environment ministries, perhaps agriculture ministries. So with this first draft that will come from the work that we are doing now, you will be able to, to bring other people to the table and to keep uh, co-creating. Um, we will start preparing the strategic research and innovation agenda, which is the second part after this draft. And I envisage a um, um, second strategic workshop in March uh, 2020, where I hope to have already around the table uh, both parts, the uh, research and the environment. And in the meantime, or before or after, uh, we are also um, thinking of opening a broader consultation with the broad uh, community. Um, next year, is, uh, we have one year to finalize the partnership, the uh, strategic research agenda, and possibly the first uh, plan of activities. And that's why in 2020, we envisage other kind of activities and workshops, I think that would be very good opportunity to use the Green Week organized by DG Environment to have a session on the European Partnership and also the RNI days in September where the, the draft SRIA uh, has to be already very advanced or possibly finalized if we really want to be in the first wave of European partnerships to start in 2021. This, we have done this because we really want to be transparent and open and to, give, to, to open this partnership to the whole community and to fill this triangle uh, science, policy and uh, society. Um, after me, this division of DG environment, enough talking about research. We <laughs> And I introduce to you Karin Zandberger. Thank you. Good afternoon, colleagues. My name is Karin Zandberger. I work in DG Environment in the Biodiversity Unit. I have earlier been in DG Research, so I'm very happy to always come back to the research community, in particular in such a very special moment. I mean, when you said you would like to be in the first row, I think you have to be in the first row. I think you really should aim for that. And I'm very confident because I see biodiversity has been in its third generation. I mean, you are a very broad community, a very settled community. I mean, there's been decades of European research. And in a way now, this is really the moment of getting the critical mass together. And not only the critical mass of research, of course, as Maria has said, and this time, I mean, it was music in my ears when you said this. I mean, it's also about working together with policies and having the political impact, the impact on policy in mind. And I think it's 
very, we can really work together for what I would actually call the perfect storm, but in a positive sense. The next year, 2020, I mean, people call it, this is the super year for nature. Have you heard this term already? Some maybe, or super year for biodiversity. Now, this is not just a political slogan, because it truly is, as we are gathering in order to, for, for a new global deal for nature, for EU biodiversity strategy, and also through the work on the nature-based solution that came out of the Climate Action Summit, now all of a sudden, these things seem to really, which have been dealt with in different, um, in different sections, really come together to work jointly. Now, just to give you a bit of a flavor, so we, we will have the World uh, Economic Forum in Davos, which will likely also have speaking on nature, on nature-based solutions. You will have a UN summit with uh, heads of states dedicated to nature. You will have the CBD COP um, in Kunming, which hopefully will adopt the post-2020 biodiversity framework. And then after that, there will be the UNFCC COP in Glasgow and Italy jointly, where it can be expected that nature will, nature, nature-based solutions will play a big role. So where are you in this? I mean, the research community, obviously, there's a lot we already know, but we are in times where, I mean, it's changing even faster than we can think. So obviously we need to have our policies, our implementation of policies accompanied by research and influenced by research. So it must be a true partnership. And in this partnership, to be a true partnership, it's really crucial. And that will be the novelty for the researchers. And unfortunately, I don't see many of my colleagues sitting here. I would have really hoped to have half and half in the big mixture, but I'm convinced that this will come because it's absolutely crucial that the environment ministries, I mean, ideally from all member states, are really involved in that. That will make the partnership super solid and it, can, it will be irresistible. But it needs it because otherwise it will easily be, I think, um, yeah, can get on, on a side track. If you really want to stay in the mainstream, and I mean, the, the moment is as crucial and as important as time as it could never be. Because on, in addition to all these events happening on international level, I mean, Josefina and Maria, you both mentioned already, there's the European Green Deal. I mean, the incoming president-elect of the European Commission, she really changed the situation, basically, it's a U-turn of 180%, if you think five years back. She put the bar extremely high. I mean, in her political guidelines, she wrote, protecting and restoring ecosystems must guide all our thinking. I mean, it's not just thinking of the nature conservation community or, the, or thinking of the um, uh, biodiversity community. No, it's really across board. Now, probably whoever wrote this didn't quite realize how much it is, but now it's really in our camp to I mean, to deliver on that. It's a tremendous opportunity, but it's also, I mean, it's a huge challenge, of course. I mean, also timely-wise, so that, but therefore, this reason, we really need this partnership with research. And I mean, I think for once, things really fall together, that EU, the horizon Europe, I mean, usually we always say, oh, how about they do is invent new, new instruments, new instruments. But this time around, I mean, this particular instrument, I think, can really become a game changer. If we manage to make it solid and to make it together, research and policy and also the other stakeholders. So I'm glad to see that you will open it even further. Now, it sounds, I see some concerned faces here, think, oh my God, all this, but I'm a true believer that this can become, call it the beginning of a real strong friendship, and we need more than a friendship, we need partnership, we need solidarity, because we have the challenges at hand are enormous, but the opportunities are equally and timely. I mean, in a way, I think we should really aim to be in the first batch. I mean, it's never been so, yeah, how I said it, so, so tailor-made, because in a way, if for EU and also at Kunming, at the COP15, it's about also to show what do we do? I mean, how is the European Union investing? How is the European Union, I mean, preparing and doing in order to, to tackle this huge challenge? And I mean, to come together with the pocket, having there is a, this enormous partnership is kind of ready to start and kind of accompany all these activities, I mean, this would be, I mean, a super us in our game. And again, I would see that, I mean, please correct me if I'm wrong, that this partnership can also go beyond 
Europe, no? I mean, you can maybe in the next phase also think about international part. It was something that European research has often been actually envied for. I mean, having these partnerships amongst or these consortiums amongst different member states, amongst different countries, that's something that's actually rarely happen outside of the world. I mean, like if you look at the US, US I mean, they, have, they, don't, they don't have this opportunity often, so they really are quite jealous actually of the EU in this respect. And now let's go even a step further, collaborating research, collaborating research plus policy makers in order to make really solid policy instruments and also solid implementation. I mean, as a matter of fact, we don't have a choice, do we? Because if we look at what IPCC, IPES and all the other re researchers have put in our, uh, I mean, in front of us, that we kind of have only 10 years left in order to really tackle this challenge or unless we'll face probably un, really uncomfortable consequences. So I'm happy to be kind of part of it on this journey. I'm really sure there will be more of policymakers in the quite near future. And I'm looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Hello. Uh, if my colleague Marco Weidert is here, we will have a couple of slides on the marine ecosystems. If he is not, then my other colleague, Marco Fritz, will uh, tell us about um, research and innovation policy and why and how can we Im increase the impact of our research. Thank you. So, um, one Marco is as good as the other. <laughs> you see, so what I do is a bit, I help you a bit to understand the mechanics you want to put behind it between research and environment ministries and what role the partnership should play in putting the biodiversity research agendas. So you have heard from Maria the background we have uh, in the preparation of the next framework program from 2021 to 2027, we have uh, made from a legal basis what we call a strategic programming. This is now in the making at this very moment and there is, by the way, a consultation open on the strategic orientation lines on what European research should do. If you don't have it, I send again an invitation to Claire and Claire will send it to all of you possibly this evening, because the consultation is open till the 17th of November. So you have a few days. That gives the frame where the partnership is working in. So we, will, we need to be clear as well, what this partnership does needs to be coherent and feeding in to what the strategic lines for the first part of the European Horizon Europe um, research program gives. So what you need always to have in hand is what these strategic lines want to. So where are the priorities for biodiversity? What we do normally is from these strategic lines, we will then make the work program. So the calls, etc. And these we will do possibly in two years batches. So the first one, 20, 21, 22, the next one, 20, 23, 24, etc. What I would guess is that this biodiversity partnership, when it starts in 21, it will not be a lot involved in shaping the um, first work program 2021, but then in the next years, when it really comes in. So, Keep in mind what, what, what you want to achieve. You will have it in 2024, 25, it will, it will realize. So that is a bit of a time frame. I believe you should a bit look at when you want to know what the impact of this partnership will be and the objectives we speak about in a moment. We have next to the partnership, and that will, is also important, we have created another tool, which, is, which we call the missions. So how can we focus our research and innovation efforts into big, what I would call a big ticket, which allows us to make major advancements, helped by, f by research, but also to policy and regulation, etc. And we have selected five missions, one on health, that is a little bit less important for, bio for this biodiversity partnership, even if we have a lot of links between health and biodiversity. 
But there are four of us which are very much, very much clearly going to the topics which we want this biodiversity partnership to cover. So one is on um, oceans, where we have the ocean biodiversity. One is on climate adaptation and social transformation, where we have very clearly the contribution of nature to adaptation, but also the other way around, what means adaptation on nature, that is certainly something we will discuss, and the social transformations. So Karin has mentioned IPBES, we very much know that we have to transform very quickly uh, our societies if we want to achieve uh, stopping biodiversity loss. Nobody really knows how. So, and where research comes into it. I think research, one of the role of research is to help policymakers how we can achieve these transformative changes. That will be certainly something which this biodiversity partnership would need to look at as well. Third mission is on soil and food production. So very clearly you have a soil biodiversity and the links to food. And number four, which is very important as well, is on cities. So how we can make cities more biodiversity relevant. You see the point. So these missions will go in parallel to the partnership, but we make sure, and that is our mechanics, that they are always linked with what this mission will do, what the missions want to do, the, mo the money which will be mobilized by, by the missions will be coherent and, and add up to what the partnership does. So it will be a, an interesting task to make all of this um, around. Josefina has spoken about the SRIA, so we, we will have a biodiversity research agenda. And what we want to do with this partnership, that is our aim, is we want to help this partnership, helping us to align and to make coherent the EU biodiversity research agenda, which we have mainly through Horizon Europe, and the national biodiversity research agendas in the 27 member states we will have possibly as of next year where biodiversity research agenda exist. So, and then um, the next aim, what we want to do with this partnership as well in research is of course mobilizing resources. So we do one thing which we have never done before. So it is, it's very new, this co-creation and co-design phase. We give away part of what we have done before in-house, we give it to you. You as a biodiversity partnership should help us to tell us what we should put into the work program in the next years. So it gives, we give things away to you. We want you to, fo to help us to focus on the right issues. The price you have to pay is first, the co-fund means you have to give something in, into it. We will top it up. The second is, I would have a lot of difficulties to understand how we can approve this partnership if we would not have a sufficient and substantial implication of environmental ministries, as uh, Karin has said before. So it's very, that would be my, if, if I would have one message is to the research people here, try to get the environment ministry partners on board. Uh, that is very, very important here. So, and then you need to see how we deal with it, who gives what and who does what, etc. But without having a clearer connection between what biodiversity wants from research in policy and the, what the biodiversity partnership can, can enable the biodiversity research to give back to policies, to enable the biodiversity policy, for example, the next biodiversity strategy. We want to have a research element in there and the biodiversity partnership certainly will play uh, uh, an important role. So that is a bit, I, I think, the landscape of, I would call it even mechanics, which we, which we want to put uh, together with you. So all of that said is that this is a, a kind of a next step on the assessment that we had in the past, but at least in Horizon 2020, we could see that what policy, policy was asking from research and research was asking, to, was offering to policy, was not well coordinated, neither necessarily at EU level and not at the member states level as well. So this partnership should help us to bring both of them better together. Thank you.
Now it's your turn. This is the question and answer session. And uh, we would be happy to start uh, discussing, to start having debate on the topics that we just uh, presented. And maybe some new things to the table to be discussed later on. Is there any comment or question? I hope I'm more active. So you understood everything. You're ready to write the first draft and the RIA and all the list of activities. Xavier, I think it's your time to <laughs> present what is your vision. And I expect that after you present your vision, there will be a lot of questions and, and comments. Thank you. And um, I use uh, the opportunity to thank again uh, the EC, not only for co-organizing this workshop uh, with us, but uh, also for the support to continue support to Biodevasa, allowing uh, to be in this position today to, uh, to prepare such a, a partnership. Okay, so uh, uh, what I uh, will uh, present here, it's a very preliminary draft. Huh? It's uh, only because to, to think, to ask you uh, some feedbacks, etc. It's needed to, to give uh, food for thought. And uh, so the, the basis um, has been elaborated, uh, uh, it was a short time ago. Huh? Um, and uh, before presenting what could be the architecture and uh, possible uh, first insight into the substance of uh, such a European partnership, uh, for the reason why we need this, I think it's good that we will repeat the same thing. It shows a convergence <laughs> between as the EC and the uh, Biodevasa partners. Uh, indeed, it's needed because uh, it's more and more recognized that biodiversity uh, status is uh, fundamental uh, when we are talking about sustainability. Uh, one example is the way to present this uh, here, uh, the, the way to present uh, SDGs, uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, this way to present it, uh, you see that uh, it's a way to highlight that the uh, making sure that there is a good status of biodiversity is fundamental because uh, many other uh, uh, SDGs actually depend on this to a large extent. So it would be uh, crazy to think that we aim and we try to reach sustainability and different goals like this without uh, or missing uh, to address uh, the key aspect of the biosphere uh, good status. And uh, as said by uh, Karine, indeed, uh, I think it's more and more recognized. Um, we can thank, for instance, the IPBES, uh, the recent assessments of the IPBES. It's true for the global assessment, it's true for the assessment for Europe and Central Asia, demonstrating the current status and the need, the emergency to, uh, to do something to counteract. And counteract, why? Uh, actually counteract uh, the drivers, direct and indirect drivers of the biodiversity crisis. Um, uh, you see also at the bottom uh, the mention of uh, the EU Green Deal, indeed. Uh, we appreciate this as a very strong signal at the European level uh, to take seriously climate change, biodiversity issues, um, and to try to tackle this in a systemic uh, approach. And um, Karin also said that uh, we have in front of us uh, the need for revision or uh, dating some biodiversity targets uh, for policy making, etc. So uh, probably mobilization of uh, uh, all the kind of actors and research is fundamental here. So the vision for this partnership, um, it's a bit an extension of the, the, the vision we have in uh, the Biodiversity 3 r It's uh, to move from the current status at the top with a decrease uh, of the, uh, well, we do have a biodiversity loss. Maybe we can phrase it uh, ele elegantly. Huh? It's, uh, it can uh, think in terms of uh, species uh, loss. It can be also collapse of populations very often, uh, etc. Uh, and why? Because um, uh, human activities very often they consider uh, biodiversity as a resource you can exploit. Uh, using kind of mining approach, uh, mining without accounting for the possible sustainability uh, of nature. 
And, uh, and second, we have also uh, the intrinsic value of nature. That is, we have also to think that uh, nature, uh, it's a patrimony for future generations, etc. So it's beyond the utilitarian view on biodiversity, there is also a moral issue to, uh, to preserve uh, biodiversity. And so how we can move from uh, this situation to the situation presented below, that is to halt uh, biodiversity loss, uh, through a range of things, that is um, to promote uh, conservation of biodiversity, uh, restoration, and also uh, in terms of uh, use of and uh, management of biodiversity, how to do this in a sustainable manner. And finally, how to consider biodiversity not only as a problem that uh, humans face when they want to implement their activity, no, as a source, a key asset for solutions also uh, offering solutions to key societal challenges. So um, uh, this is, to do this, it's easy to put it on a, on a screen, but to do this, it's huge. Huh? You have to realize the reason why uh, we have this situation. And uh, to, to move from here to, uh, to the bottom, it's a really a systemic, a systemic uh, change we need to do. Uh, and we need to think in terms of uh, not only uh, ecological uh, rules, but also governance, uh, uh, finances, uh, social issues, uh, etc. So uh, that's why we need a very broad range of uh, stakeholders uh, to, uh, to work on such a partnership. So uh, the preliminary discussions uh, uh, and work we had between uh, Badavasa partners and, uh, and the EC services uh, led to this uh, first draft for a possible vision for the partnership. Uh, you have seen the title, it's Rescuing Biodiversity to Safeguard Life on Earth. It can change, of course, but uh, this is the way it's presented. And uh, you can see that uh, for now, we have recognized four pillars, four main objectives. Um, the first one is uh, uh, focused on knowledge generation. That is, we do need to generate knowledge to better understand biodiversity loss, because we still need uh, matrix quantification of the biodiversity dynamics, etc. Uh, knowledge on the drivers, indirect and direct drivers of biodiversity dynamics, and also knowledge on levels of action. So uh, this is calling uh, for elaboration of a strategic agenda uh, with common priorities. And this is calling also uh, for the implementation of more systemic uh, research and innovation program uh, to understand the drivers, to understand the impact of these drivers on biodiversity and the levels of action. And uh, finally, the expected impacts, uh, as you can see, it's uh, science-based actions to protect, restore, and sustainably manage our natural capital based on uh, what uh, uh, can science uh, offer. So you see the, the logic of this uh, graph. Uh, you see also the, the four other pillars. The second one, its uh, main objective is to co-design and evaluate solutions, engaging strongly stakeholders. So um, the first pillar, the key word, it's uh, research innovation program and knowledge. The second pillar, um, it's uh, stakeholder engagement and uh, solutions. And here, what is at stake, it's uh, elaboration of a range of methodologies to value the natural capital. Um, engagement of a range of stakeholders, it includes businesses, citizens, practitioners, etc. Uh, and at the end, the objective is really to mainstream biodiversity um, among a range of uh, sectors, including private uh, key private sectors, and also the possibility to develop and deploy uh, nature-based solutions. The third pillar, it's um, really connected to uh, the need to, uh, to connect knowledge and uh, innovation to policy and policy making. Uh, so it's uh, really called by, well, DG Environment, so it's called by a range of uh, um, EPA, for instance, by ministries of environment. Um, on the one hand, we have to recognize we need policy-oriented research and innovation program. It is research and innovation programs that will 
hear the need from uh, policymakers, uh, in particular for biodiversity policymakers. And um, uh, in complement, uh, we need also science based evaluation and, and guidance of uh, policies. And uh, at the end, the expected impact here is effective use of uh, knowledge to design, implement, and evaluate policies. And the last pillar, and I think it will uh, answer maybe your concern, uh, Karin, about uh, the need for international dimension. Uh, the third one is indeed to recognize that we need to increase the global dimension and impact of research and innovation. Uh, this means strategic collaboration with the IPBES. Uh, we will need to be very serious about this, to engage seriously uh, with IPBES to run the different functions of IPBES. Uh, it's not written here, but indeed to engage non-European uh, key players also for research and innovation uh, uh, programs, uh, also for uh, uh, environmental issues. And then, uh, for, for now, it's uh, indicated here, uh, autonomous regions and uh, uh, overseas countries and territories, the need, the specific needs they may have, and uh, this partnership will have to take this into account when we discuss about biodiversity. Uh, there is a uh, there are key issues at stake in, um, in these regions, countries, and territories. Either it would be at the end uh, identified in such a pillar, or it can be ident identified on the way, but uh, we do need to recognize we will have to, uh, to take this seriously into account. Okay. Uh, and so what is expected is research and innovation, contribution to IPBES, contribution to uh, the future uh, framework for uh, biodiversity policies post 2020, uh, etc. So this is maybe the most important at this stage, and uh, it's a draft. Uh, so you are here to challenge, to complement, to propose uh, improvement amendments to this. But you see, uh, the the four pillars are the complement. It's it's presented this way. Maybe there are other ways to present, to recognize it's not uh, silos at all. Huh? Uh, there will be strong links between uh, these. But I, I hope you realize uh, how broad the, the ambition is for such a European partnership. Uh, for those who know ERANET, classical ERANET, for instance, we are far from here. Uh, it's, uh, we are going towards more comprehensive uh, tools with a range of activities which are needed uh, given the challenge ahead. So um, uh, three challenges which were identified uh, very early when el elaborating then what we could do, how we could do to uh, develop such a partnership. The first one, it's the need uh, to integrate across actors. It has been said already, so it's easy for me just to remind that what is expected is um, to account, uh, well, to, to realize that today, uh, in the current landscape, m at the national, local level, at the European level, uh, very often, indeed, um, uh, we, we lack, or we, we don't have sufficient dialogue, possibility of co-design between research policymakers and uh, environment biodiversity policymakers. So one key aspect, it has been raised uh, also by Marco. Uh, the need for this partnership to gather these different types of, acti um, of actors to work together, to be in a position to co-design uh, the range of activities that uh, are expected. Um, and this will be also done by establishing strong links with uh, a range of stakeholders. Uh, not cite uh, all of them, but uh, you have citizens not written here, you have NGOs, you have businesses, you have a, a broad range of uh, stakeholders, practitioners, managers, etc. Um, we have to take into account the fact that other actors, other sectors, other ministries also uh, will be important because biodiversity is relevant for uh, uh, much beyond uh, uh, environmental policy makers for sure. And um, we have to be ready also to engage uh, with third parties. Uh, that is, we will not have to reinvent the wheel. We do have, for some functions, um, tools, initiatives, organizations working very well, 
doing the, the job, so uh, we may uh, find a way uh, to engage with them and possibly to support them uh, also. Second challenge, it's uh, the challenge of integration across level. So uh, I will be quicker on this. Huh? It's uh, the need for biodiversity to do the job. You need to better integrate between the local national level, European and international indeed. So this partnership, um, I think that the tool, European partnership, is uh, excellent for this because de facto you gather local national authorities and players and stakeholders with European uh, policymakers, uh, stakeholders, and I think you begin to be credible also to properly engage with uh, key international uh, stakeholders. So um, I think it's the ambition and um, it can be helpful to, uh, uh, to have a partnership for this. And the third and last challenge, there are others, huh, but uh, raised here, it's uh, to recognize that we need also a tool able to integrate a broad range of uh, activities, uh, going much beyond the elaboration of research and innovation uh, program and uh, funding of research, etc. So it's not new uh, in Biodiversa, we have pushed this for years, but uh, I think it will be a further step. Um, um, and uh, so you have here a range of uh, functions, maybe uh, what was less um, promoted uh, so far, if I'm thinking about uh, Biodiversa, you have the implementation of uh, mobility schemes, for instance. You have a, maybe a more systematic promotion of data reuse, synthesis research, etc., which can be very efficient also to support um, uh, policy uh, making. Uh, better link with infrastructure, observatories, demonstrators. I think it's uh, highly needed, maybe also to promote the link with uh, citizens and, um, and citizen science uh, also per se. And uh, we have worked on this, but uh, it will be needed because we, we will ask a systemic change. It will be needed also to be ready for capacity building. We, we cannot expect all these actors, a range of stakeholders, to move along this direction without step-by-step step proposing uh, capacity uh, building tools to uh, help the transition we uh, aim at. Okay, uh, and maybe the last point, it's uh, to promote international cooperation. Again, uh, we have made this uh, in Bailvasa, but uh, here probably uh, the ambition should uh, increase. Okay, and now to finish, uh, the way we have for now tried to structure uh, the presentation, more detailed presentation of the European Partnership on Biodiversity, we have used the intervention logic um, uh, that I present here. So it's something we have uh, reused. Uh, it, it's something used in different arena uh, uh, to evaluate uh, different uh, tools. But I think it's fully uh, adequate um, when we think about uh, intervention through a European partnership here on biodiversity. So you see that we start in uh, orange brown. We have to take into account uh, the existence of a range of uh, external factors and a policy landscape which exists, the current status. According to this, we have to define needs in grid. And from these needs, then we define the objectives of the partnership. We define also the inputs, required inputs. It can be uh, the actors uh, we need to, um, to gather, the skills we need, uh, the funding uh, and resources we need uh, to, to do this. And then the portfolio of activities that the partnership should cover. And finally, the expected outputs of the partnership. And so in black, it's really what is at stake for the partnership and what we can control, I would say. It's our job to do this. And then you see that from the outputs, then we have results and impact expected. And then you see it's not in black. Why? Because impact, we know that uh, you can do a perfect job in terms of outputs, etc. But for other reasons, and you see the, the arrows <laughs> with external factors, policy landscape, etc. Uh, maybe we have to recognize that the um, real impact, they depend on many things. But still, we do ex expect effects of the partnership um, and concrete impacts. And you see that uh, using this, we can evaluate the relevance, the coherence, 
efficiency, effectiveness, and added value of the partnership. And so the last four slides, we have one per pillar, and this is a slide we will, you will use in the uh, sessions to try to challenge this, to try to amend, to complement. You can also say that this is important, it's good, <laughs> you, you have the right to, to say this, uh, but uh, also to challenge. It's only a draft, it's a very it's the beginning, so um, it's completely flexible. It's a notion of uh, co-design. So for this one, uh, the first pillar for reinforcement of the knowledge basis, uh, according to the landscape, you, you see the two needs identified so far. It's to defragment the research and innovation landscape between actors, between countries, between the uh, national and European level, etc. And second, uh, research innovation, as I say, to understand and tackle the biodiversity loss. And so uh, you see the objectives. First, to promote joint programming on biodiversity uh, across the whole European research area and to be able to promote a program, research and innovation program, more systemic and really addressing the status, the drivers and the level of actions for uh, the biodiversity crisis. The inputs, we recognize that it will be needed to gather a major research and innovation program owners and managers, that is ministries of research and innovation, that is uh, funding agencies, it can be foundation, etc across uh, countries, uh, possibly to pool public and also private uh, research and innovation investment. And here we have a specific uh, highlight um, among other stakeholders. Uh, we want to highlight the need to engage with the live program. Because if we want to make a difference, we, in terms of different notation, we need to establish a better link between research and innovation program and more implementation on the ground program, which is uh, more the the work of life, and so we need to articulate uh, the work of the partnership and the work of life, and they are open to, to do this, so uh, we'll have to, to evaluate. The activities, okay, a range of uh, things for mapping the, the current situation, uh, foresight, identification of emerging issues, um, identification of common vision and shared priorities, and then uh, you see activity four, it's to develop annual joint calls, which is a uh, huge, uh, it's only one line here, and uh, transfer knowledge and innovation from funded projects. And uh, the output, I would say a bit uh, less on the output and uh, um, uh, impact, but uh, you see uh, uh, how it, it works for this. So I think that uh, this is uh, the pillar on knowledge basis, research and innovation program, and um, in trying to do this in a more encompassing uh, way. And the ambition uh, for this part, uh, just uh, an idea of what could be the funding level, uh, you see, uh, as compared to what has been made in Biodiversa between phase one, two, and three, uh, you see that the level of uh, ambition is uh, further increased. Um, and we have been quite conservative. Huh? Uh, I think it's fully feasible. And we will see, uh, according to the, of course, to the to the commitments from countries, etc., we'll see where we are at the end. Second pillar, it's a co-design and evaluation of solutions and net grain. So the need here, first need is to better connect research and innovation to society actors and their needs. Second, it's to have research and innovation in support of practitioners and uh, for developing solutions corresponding to their needs. And third, it's uh, it's also expected to mainstream biodiversity in key sectors. So here, objective one is to integrate research and innovation activities with relevant stakeholders, so stakeholder engagement. Second, uh, uh, it's to make Europe uh, a leader for the way we would be able to sustainably uh, manage, conserve uh, biodiversity, and also develop uh, nature-based solutions. So. Uh, in terms of inputs, uh, I will have to be maybe quicker now, uh, but uh, you see that uh, uh, we will have to be very serious, uh, or to go on uh, being serious, in terms of involvement uh, of research and innovation actors to integrate stakeholders. Uh, and we have identified uh, OPLA, I've seen Jonathan uh, here, so OPLA is represented, uh, so 
you see we do expect a strong link with OPLA. Um, engagement with a range of enterprises, and I'm happy to, to see that there are different representatives of uh, businesses here. Um, we also think that the European uh, Business Biodiversity Platform is a key player here. We we'll need to engage also with the uh, European uh, Society for um, uh, Citizen Science. And finally, um, we we'll have to take into account the need to establish contact with other sectors, other partnerships, missions, etc. So uh, I, will be, uh, I will let you maybe uh, have a look at the broad range of activities uh, planned here, uh, uh, including uh, building capacities for stakeholder engagement, citizen science, how to promote this, uh, to develop public-private uh, joint actions, to promote mobility schemes, in particular between academia and business. Uh, we need also a research and innovation program to develop and deploy uh, nature-based solutions. And uh, at the end, this should be used to raise awareness and to mainstream biodiversity. So again, I will not say too much on outputs and impacts. Third pillar uh, for this one is to connect knowledge and innovation to policy, to policy making. Um, so indeed, the need is to uh, better connect research and innovation. And this time, it's to policy stakeholders, let's say, uh, and their needs. Um, and in complement to have research and innovation program able to generate knowledge in support of these uh, policy needs. And finally, uh, to be in a position, uh, I see if it's possible for me to, to see the slide, and I hate to see myself like this. Oh, yeah. How can uh, I add? Okay. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so it was uh, the need for uh, knowledge brokerage and synthesis also for policy making. Huh? So uh, we will need a first objective to reinforce the science policy interface. That is not only to have vague things, but to have uh, something uh, more and more professional, more, more efficient. Um, and support uh, policy makers to evaluate, to monitor the efficiency of policy um, and uh, it can be biodiversity policies, but it can be more generally policy areas affecting uh, biodiversity. So the inputs uh, we need here, coordinated involvement of biodiversity policy makers and managers, and of research and innovation policy makers and managers. This is why we need all these actors on board. Uh, we have identified Eclipse as a key player, MICE also, and the uh, projects linked to MICE. Um, and uh, the need also to take into account the national monitoring scheme, European mon monitoring scheme for biodiversity. Uh, activities, uh, you see quickly, to implement research and innovation programs to reinforce the knowledge uh, basis on important policy issues, to provide science-based support to policy assessment in relation to uh, European national biodiversity observatories, and uh, to reinforce the science policy interface in order to finally guide policy implementation. Again, uh, uh, in what is said here, the objective of this partnership is not to reinvent the wheel. It will be uh, to engage with all the key uh, uh, initiatives uh, present and, and doing already a, a good job on, on these kind of issues. Okay, and finally, the, the last pillar, number four, uh, here, the need is uh, to have European and research innovation program and actor with stronger links with IPBES. Uh, the feeling is that uh, we can do more in terms of engagement of the research and innovation community in, into IPBES, uh, not only assessment, uh, all uh, IPBES functions. Uh, also, to promote the global visibility and leadership of European research and innovation and biodiversity and uh, how to have research and innovation programs that would fulfill the specific needs of uh, autonomous regions and uh, uh, overseas uh, countries and territories. So the objective uh, is to really uh, promote collaboration between research and innovation, joint programming on biodiversity and IPBES. So probably, again, with a kind of formal engagement with IPBES. Um, second objective, to raise the leadership uh, of uh, European research and innovation and policy, and to develop joint programming, accounting for the specificities of uh, uh, autonomous regions and OCTs. 
so I, I said strong engagement, formal engagement, probably uh, with IPBS. Uh, to be sure, second input, you see, to be sure that we will have a critical mass of uh, autonomous regions, OCTs, on board this partnership. Uh, if we want to do this, we need this. Uh, and also collaboration, engagement with uh, key international networks. So the activities, again, we will have to map the landscape, in particular in terms of uh, uh, the landscape at the international level. Uh, we can also be clear on the current implication of research and innovation actors in IPBES. Uh, we can think about research and innovation programs that would fulfill the gaps identified by IPBES. Um, there is also some messages that uh, this partnership could uh, think uh, in, in terms of capacity building for some uh, countries to allow uh, some countries and some research and innovation actors to better engage in IP-based activities. And um, as I said, some uh, concrete uh, programs finally uh, fulfilling the needs of OIs and OCTs. Okay, so I will... Um, it's a bit long, but uh, this is really the substance we will ask you to react on. So that's why I took uh, some time to, to do this. Again, only food for thought. So it's flexible. It's an uh, early stage. Huh? It has been presented, the, the timing by Josefina. So uh, we do have time uh, to listen to all the feedbacks from uh, the broad range of uh, stakeholders. This is why we expect you to spot all the important things um, that uh, you think we, we, sh we should modify, we should uh, uh, amend, or we should um, add to this. And uh, thank you in advance. So the way uh, it will work now, I let uh, Claire, or maybe there are questions. Uh -huh. Yeah, we have a bit of time for question and answer session to... <laughs> So do you have a, do you have questions? So I see Maurice in the back, and then we have uh, Karin and Per. And, and then. How do you see the connection with the other partnerships, like the one on uh, agroecology and living labs, the one on uh, water for all, and the one, for example, on Earthy Ocean? Yeah. So um, for for this first, of course, we will have to to see what will emerge. And, uh, but uh, the way I see this, it's, uh, we, we should use the same philosophy we have used in Biodiversity, that is, we have to recognize that uh, regularly there will be crossroad between uh, biodiversity and different sectors. And so we should engage with them actively and proactively, maybe, uh, and be ready to prepare uh, uh, when, uh, when it makes sense on different, uh, not only calls, but uh, for the broad range of activities we are talking about, not to, to think we will do everything on our own through such a partnership, but to engage with these uh, partnerships and to have a range of uh, joint activities. At the same time, we have to make sure it's still feasible and uh, we remain uh, coherent with uh, the partnership, but uh, we have to be ready to engage actively with them. Yeah. I hope this is what you have in mind also. We can have, of course, some joint goal, joint activities. But furthermore, for example, in relation with living labs, you can use that for agriculture purposes, but you can, uh, sustainable agriculture, but you can uh, use them for biodiversity, biodiversity evolution. So, so you see, it, it could be not only calls, but also a, a, a long set of activities, which are, as we are wo soon working, between GPI Water, GPI uh, uh, FACHE, and the Biodiversa to have some common approach on joint SREA on, on some points to avoid duplications, in fact. I f fully agree. I, I think the uh, agroecology is very interesting because it's focused on uh, living labs. And so it's possible also that they would be very happy to have uh, other kind of activities uh, implemented with us. And I'm thinking... Uh, Another partnership, uh, which is on uh, environmental observations, if I'm right. And again, uh, it's, uh, I think we can expect a very uh, easy uh, uh, synergies. 
Just maybe that helps you. you. You also need to understand that I think the biodiversity partnership is possibly in an advanced stage if you look what other partnerships will do. So you are relatively far away. What we do at this, at this very moment, we inform the other partnerships what is happening here. So you have been at the SCAR, so the Standing Committee for Agricultural Research, to present the biodiversity partnership. We, ex we do try to um, exchange information with uh, what you have said on the Earth observation. I'm pretty confident that this will become clearer with time. So, but very clearly, we, I guess we, what you have said, we, the principle is clear. This partnership can't solve everything on biodiversity. The more which is in the other partnerships on biodiversity, the better. And you need to see how you link both to each other when they are coming in the, in the run. I have two comments, the one on pillar one, where maybe you can back, go back to the slide. Under the activities, I would like to suggest to add one, an activity seven EU monitoring or monitoring on EU level. I mean, it can nicely be blended in with the other activities, but I think it's worthwhile to directly mention it, first of all, because monitoring most of the time over always falls into the cracks. And now here, as we are in co-design and evaluation of solutions and policies, I mean, the EU-wide monitoring is very important for Pillar 2. And then the other comment for Pillar 4, you mentioned collaboration with IPES, absolutely, absolutely, but I would also suggest collaboration with IPCC. Notably, IPES and IPCC are kind of converging on many messages. I think we should not be afraid making this link because to avoid that there's remaining parallel streams. I know there's another partnership on climate and I know there's kind of always a bit of a people are nervous, then we will be merged. But I mean, I think somehow we need to, maybe we don't uh, say it out loud right now, but have it on definitely on the mind, because I think the science community is converging and it should not be seen that this partnership is for IPES, and then I think there's another partnership on climate change. This works with IPCC, works together. Uh, thank you. Per Schoengel, the uh, senior uh, research officer from the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency. I would like to kind of put forward a more overarching uh, comment with reference to uh, applica applicable European law, and that is the Article 18 of the Habitats Directive. And it explicitly says that member state and the Commission shall encourage the necessary research and scientific work to fulfill the obligations in uh, Article 2 and, and uh, other articles as well. And I think that this partnership is really important also for that matter, and it could be added really to the, the description that Article 2 is largely about what to do and measures to take in order to conserve biodiversity of course, focusing on what is listed in the annexes with respect to habitats and species of uh, community interest of the European community, uh, but also uh, in, in the larger, because uh, it might also be that, for instance, Arctic foxes depend on the availability of voles. The voles are not in the habitats directive, but they are really critically important food for the species, the Arctic fox, which is on the list. So it all kind of fits together. So uh, from Sweden, we are very, uh, very, very uh, positive about this partnership. And uh, it's also with the regards from the Ministry of Environment. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And what you said, I think it's fully relevant, in particular, for instance, for Pillar 3. Uh, so uh, OK, thanks. And thank you for the support from Sweden. <laughs> Hello, Sandra Jacobs from INBO and from the Biodiversity Platform. I had a question on the third pillar. So the second and the, and the, the first and the second pillar have clear impact and results like um, implementing actions to conserve biodiversity or uh, uh, realizing nature-based solutions, which are real physical uh, impacts which are aimed at. But in the third pillar, 
I don't see anything like uh, adapting existing policies, introducing or designing new policies. Um, would that be a, would that be something to add, maybe? Right. We don't have the, the slide, so I'm taking this on paper. Yeah, it's ah, okay. on the screen. I can see this uh, yeah. little X, X, X. Maybe that was meant to be yeah. designing new policies or adapting existing policies, or maybe that's something that is a bit sensitive to put in if we want the partnership to be successful. Yeah, but, uh, we we I use it on, on the uh, your, your comment. It's to be clear on the tangible uh, product for this pillar. Huh? Yeah. So the way policy. to, to yeah. express this. Yeah. Okay. Well noted. Even if uh, uh, you see what is here, it's uh, at the end we should have a clear demonstration of how we have been able to mobilize, uh, to guide uh, science-based uh, guidance for policy implementation, for policy evaluation, and uh, etc. It, uh, it would be the, the and uh, we need here success stories to demonstrate it. It's done. It's not uh, like this. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, I, I mainly asked this question because we, we now know that there is a need for transformative change, which means that within existing policies and existing frameworks, it will be very difficult to uh, cause the necessary change. So it would be good to maybe pave the way for more deeper changes in policies and, and put this explicitly in the targets. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. I'm Kremena Gocho, a PhD researcher at the uh, Institute for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Research at the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences. And my two questions revolve sort of around money. <laughs> the first is uh, in pillar one, you had also an estimate of a significant increase of funding. But uh, in some countries, uh, the ex especially biodiversity-rich countries, actually it's difficult to raise funds. Well, we have this experience in LIFE program, we have this experience in other programs as well. So uh, this sort of uh, burden <coughs> sharing, uh, can you elaborate on it? And also uh, one possible way to make biodiversity monitoring cheaper is active engagement of citizen scientists, but this means really crowdsourcing this monitoring effort, and this means new uh, standard observations and teaching people systemic thinking beyond the single species, and uh, these two maybe should be incorporated in <coughs> Pillar 3. I do, sorry. Uh, I have been requested to answer, and I don't have a clear answer to you. Uh, one could be we should be creative also in the way we look for the commitment of our countries because contributions in kind are, are accepted. And, and, and uh, I have to remind you that the EU has only 6% of the total budget devoted to research in Europe. So 94% is in the member states hidden in infrastructures, in uh, salaries, in, in, in initiatives that you are going to do anyway and that you have already programmed probably in your, in your programs, try to figure out what is the part of biodiversity. If you can try to increase it, if you can't, propose it as in-kind contribution to the partnership. Not everything has to be money for the course. Okay. And uh, in complement, maybe, uh a few things that is, um, first, the figures I've presented, it's uh, more or less to imagine that the, what we have made in Bayelvasa, we have demonstrated the, the ambition we can have in uh, individual calls when we have uh, proper support uh, with the European Commission. The difficulty now is that uh, it's case by case uh, issues. That is, for uh, its uh, single call, we have to discuss with the Commission to see if they want to support. We have to uh, implement a specific call for action, etc. It's uh, a bit uh, difficult. So here, the objective, you, it has been presented uh, by the first uh, speaker. Uh, the ambition is to have a, a pluriannual uh, a program uh, over six uh, years, for instance. And within this program, with this grant, with the commission, to be in a position 
to discuss with um, uh, commission services and finally to have uh, a range of activities, including uh, calls, um, which uh, would allow, uh, Bulgaria is participating to Bidevasa calls, and uh, this would be still the case, so, uh, but in a more flexible manner. It's also why we expect, finally, uh, this uh, increase of uh, budget, which would not mean uh, that Bulgaria would have to increase the budget uh, when you participate to a, a call. Uh, second very important point in what you raise, I think we can think in terms of resources. Sometimes you have the opposite risk, that is, you have the risk that the country is ready to spend money in a, in a call, and finally, uh, it's uh, difficult for sometimes for small communities, for instance, uh, not necessarily Bulgaria, but uh, you have uh, uh, in, in the list of uh, possible partners, sometimes you have uh, small countries, small uh, communities, and then uh, here the story is more how to have capacity building to make sure that these communities will have their place also uh, in, uh, through the joint call. So it's uh, not resources anymore, it's more capacity building uh, also. So we have to think both sides. And as said by uh, Josefina, uh, funding in cash uh, calls, it's one aspect and there will be as you can see, many, many other activities and many opportunities to to engage and to be part of and to bring skills. Concerning the second aspect on the citizen science, one, one uh, function of the RIA is detect the parts that can also be complemented by efforts from the EU side. We still have Horizon Europe programs and we can still, uh, if the, the, the common uh, strategic agenda uh, um, can, can um, enlighten us both, we can decide that one of the parts, if you need something, I don't know, to teach, educate citizens, to set up standards, uh, the parts of this research can be funded by Horizon Calls. But the uh, setting of the data infrastructure or the, or the monitoring schemes uh, that need to be in your country, that could be a very nice and kind contribution to the to the system. Don't forget that this strategic agenda needs to be articulated with Horizon Europe and it can be synergic and complementary. So we will uh, take uh, two, three more questions and then we will have to move to the next session. So I think here, uh, I think you said you wanted and over there. Yeah. I know on Slido there are some questions, but we will uh, also see all along this session how we can uh, answer them, and we will also discuss this in the thematic session. So sorry, we cannot take all the questions. We'll do the, this one uh, there and over there, and then sorry, we will have to move. Yeah, and if we do not answer your question, you can put it on Slido so that we know what it was. Okay, thank you. Uh, Michael Mirtel from the Helmholtz Center for Environmental Research, Germany, and coordinating the European long-term ecosystem research infrastructure. I was referring to the slide with the pillar one. Could we see it, please? Um, you mentioned key elements like European research area, joint programming, and I was wondering why European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructure, S3, is not there, while in the activities you list to produce a database of research infrastructures. So S3 is producing on a biannual basis a huge European infrastructure roadmap. And my question was, was this on purpose? Because you think that the focus S3 puts is a wrong one and biodiversity research needs a different one, or if this is something you want us to contribute during the workshop? Uh, to be very clear, um, the link with the uh, research infrastructure, uh, biodiversity research infrastructure, will be key, so you're right. Huh? Um, we use your opport the opportunity to have you here, so uh, uh, bring uh, elements in this direction, we will be very happy to... Uh, and I, I recognize that uh, in terms of inputs, uh, we should also highlight the fact that uh, it's uh, a key input. Um, so the problem with this presentation, you see it's already heavy, so maybe we have been too selective or uh, not comprehensive enough, but so uh, there is no negative message at all. So during the sessions, try to be specific and to bring things in this direction. We'll be happy. Yeah, and, and 
uh, we are not going to include S3 here as such because it's already taken, but the coordination and the articulation, yes, and, and some of the common activities. And, and also because at the end we, we hope that uh, the objective is that uh, research innovation program to be implemented here. We hope that the way to do this uh, we would reinforce the synergies with the uh, infrastructure, we would reinforce the use of infrastructure to reinforce research, etc. So uh, this is the kind of synergies we, we will have to prepare with you. Huh? I have already uh, <laughs> the mic. Christo Cervantes from uh, LiveWatch Eric, Spain. Um, I found the link with uh, the live project very, very good and very important. That one goes to the implementation, more or less, of uh, the, uh, let's say, results of, of uh, the partnership. I wonder if, uh, if you have any plans to link also to the ERC uh, and uh, to programs that have to deal with innovation. We had in the Horizons 2020, we had uh, the FETs, the Future Emerging Technologies. Um, and, and with ERC, with the European Research Council, uh, I would imagine that um, if they can um, raise the line, you know, higher and higher, and guide a little bit the partnership towards the most burning scientific questions, and if that is combined with uh, any kind of uh, program like FETS or, you know, on innovation, then that would give a, a real boost to the partnership towards that direction. So I, for, for now, we have not identified probably because we saw that uh, the ERC was uh, too blue sky to, to articulate easily, but uh, we would be happy uh, to discuss with them. Uh, second, for the articulation with, uh, for, for innovation, you, you're right, and we will have to identify, uh, it's only the beginning, so we need to identify all the possible uh, key players. Of course, the risk, we, we will have to make sure that at the end we stick to something feasible <laughs> and credible, but uh, uh, we don't have to uh, neglect this a priori. We will have to evaluate uh, everything and finally to make priorities. And for the life uh, program, yeah, it's uh, straightforward because uh, um, you have to know that already uh, it's, uh, we have evidence showing that we do have already life projects, for instance, building on uh, EC funded or biodiversity funded uh, projects. Um, uh, so this is one way, but also we know that there are a lot of knowledge gaps and needs identified uh, through the uh, life program. And so it would be a pity not to take this into account. So um, this is a first step. And maybe we have begun to discuss with uh, the per person in charge of life uh, to go towards a, a better articulation. Uh, it's not uh, to, 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 to fuse at all, it's not the objective, but a real articulation to really uh, increase synergies. It will be great, that's for sure. So, but uh, we'll spot uh, what you propose. I think there is. Uh, Victor Kotowski, University of Warsaw. Uh, after uh, being here in, the, in these rooms uh, yesterday and today, uh, I became convinced uh, again and again that uh, the main problem of biodiversity in Europe is the conflict with agriculture. And uh, it is also agricultural land when our key to mitigation and uh, adaptation to climate changes. And I searched this document that you referred, uh, review, uh, showed to us, and the word agriculture is not mentioned. Uh, uh, and in the box with policies, uh, there is uh, biodiversity policies uh, mentioned, other policies, research and development policies, but there is no common agricultural policy. So my argument is to put explicitly common agricultural policy as, uh, uh, as the link between our ability to implement uh, uh, the, the proposed solution, uh, solutions. Yeah? So especially in the pillar three, if uh, we have to work with uh, any uh, of the European policies, this is the agric common agricultural policy at first instance, and even before the, the, the biodiversity policies. So this is a very simple uh, request to Edit explicitly. 
Okay, so I think it's close to what you you have said also that is the, the need to. We 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 have said the policy areas that is to recognize that uh, we will have to go beyond policy, uh, biodiversity policy, but also beyond environmental policy for sure. So uh, you cite uh, agriculture policies that's uh, important, and there are others. Huh? Uh, probably we have not made this too visible at this stage to avoid confusion. Uh, now you have to realize that uh, we are talking about uh, the cluster six uh, of. Uh, which is uh, for environment, uh, uh, natural resources, agriculture, etc. You do have partnership devoted to this. So I think this is uh, the only reason why uh, it's not so visible at this stage. Uh, but we are convinced of what you say and uh, the need to be encompassing. When, If we want solutions, we recognize uh, we need systemic solutions. We cannot do this taking account only environmental policies. The way to do this, we have to work on it. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we will stop here for the question and answer session. So once again, if you have other questions, you can go on Slido. I remind you the code to enter is hashtag Biodiversa. And we will now move to a presentation um, yeah, uh, by uh, Nerea Aspuwa on the outputs of discussion with Maes. Hi, hello. Uh, well, even if this, well, my name is Nerea, I'm from the European Commission, from the ERTD, for a unit that has the name of Climate and Planetary Boundaries. And as we said that this is the first strategic workshop, I would like to, I would like to announce that we have already a previous workshop with the MAES community. Um, I would like just for, I hope that most of you, I guess that most of you know what is MAES is about, but I would like, to, I would like to, to remind you this a little bit. So within the, bi within the bio biodiversity strategy, the, this biodiversity strategy, the, the current one, because as you know, we have one new upcoming soon. Uh, this biodiversity strategy lies a number of targets with precise actions uh, to stop the biodiversity loss. So the member states were called to map and assess the state of the ecosystem and the services within the national territory and with the assistance of the European Commission. They also must uh, to assess the economic value of such uh, ecosystem services and to promote the integration of these values into accounting and reporting system at the EU and national level. So the specific actions aims to provide a knowledge base on the ecosystems Europe uh, the ecosystem services in Europe. So all the member states have been actively involved in this mapping and assessment of the ecosystem services, that is the so-called MAIS. Um, at the EU level also, the European Environmental Agency has been involved, the, the environment has been involved, the Joint Research Center has been involved, and also DG Research and Innovation. This is, I would like to show you here a little bit how is the, the, the MAIS working streams. As you see, as the member states that are working with the, with the mapping and assessment and, and at, at member state level, we have the MAIS working group who has been producing reports and thematic pillars to, to, to implement and to see how these, uh, these reports and the results can be applied at national level. The environment has been also provide support. We have research and innovation projects like Esmeralda and the current ongoing Maya project. Uh, we have also support to IPRES and we have also Keep Inca that is working to integrate and, and assessment these not this, this capital accounts uh, and supporting the implementation in the member states. We have the, the Maya project. So there is a lot of actors involved in this MAIS group and we thought that it's important to integrate MAIS people and MAIS group within the, within the partnership. That is the reason we, we did this workshop. And what we did in the workshop, well, also to mention that MAIS has been working since 2013 Yes, to, and they have contributed to, to the process with several reports, uh, developing common typologies of ecosystem for mapping, uh, typologies for ecosystem services. So they are working on progress. 
uh, with the intention to, to produce this in December, the EU-wide ecosystem assessment, the first EU-wide ecosystem assessment will be published in, in December. And well, so the, the workshop took uh, place in, in, in September, and yes, we placed four simple questions to of the mice attended. What brought you here? What could be the benefit for MIES of an eventual integration within the, within the partnership? How could MIES contribute to the European Biodiversity Partnership? And how should be involved? And which is the level of involvement that, that we were expecting for, for this? So these were some of the, of the conclusion after, after this workshop. So, there was first there was a clear interest to to be part of the of the partnership and to integrate mice within the biodiversity partnership in particular areas related to the research policy monitoring and networks links and also opportunities some opportunities and synergies were highlighted then some of the ones that has been mentioned already in some of the questions that you have placed also some identified benefit were the possibility to upscale and getting more long-term support to the mice, to the mice community, increase the, the science policy visibility of this community, for sure influencing also the research agendas, and also the development of new methods and indicators and a wider uptake of the, of the results that mice may, may produce. Also, the potential contribution to MICE for the partnership will be bringing national and subnational commitments, understanding the policy needs better, creating more links with the policy, and main street, the biodiversity, and all the results in different sectors and in, different, in the private sector, especially also. Uh, well, for sure, at this moment, they needed more information, still some of the information that we cannot provide also uh, comments today because still we are developing this partnership process. So that's, that's the result. So still within that MICE and other ongoing communities that we will discuss today through, through the different workshops should so we'll be involved in this partnership in order to leverage more the, the results that we expect. So that's all from my side. It's just a short update. Um, if you have any question. Well, then. Maybe we just saw that on Slido we have a question uh, that was asked by four people. I mean, four people voted for it, so I can quickly ask it. Uh, when the partnership under Horizon Europe will be selected? I think. <laughs> so I give the, the floor to the EC. We, we discussed this uh, already. The first wave will be funded on the first year of Horizon Europe, but they need to be already written in the strategic programming. So when it depends when it's mature enough to produce a, 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 a good project, a good proposal with enough commitment from the member states. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then we are ready to put it in the, in the program. So it will be 2021 if You, you think that uh, the EC will uh, open uh, and as soon as a partnership is mature, uh, you propose or, with, or there will be clear deadlines? I think this is uh, the question. Huh? Of course, there will be clear deadlines. This is a co-funded partnership. It will be implemented by grants like Biodiversa. The specific rules uh, for these grants are still not written, and, and I remind you that we are writing Horizon Europe and still needs to be uh, um, adopted by the Parliament and the Council, so things, things, things may happen. But yes, the, to be in the strategic programming, so it needs to be ready by February, as Maria was mentioning, then there will be all the consultations. This RIA needs to be prepared during 2020. And the first calls will be made probably by the end of 2020 or early 2021. And of course, there will be strict deadlines. A topic will be written. A proposal needs to be uh, sent. But 
normally all this work during this year will be the, the, this proposal. Um, yeah, depends on the level of maturity. Other partnerships, uh, I repeat, will not be, will not make it for this strategic programming, will be probably mentioned uh, for further years or not mentioned at all because it will be in the, in the next cycle of strategic programming. This will have to be decided. 